An exploration of contract cheating and academic misconduct within health education. Welcome to this video presentation of a talk I originally gave at the Pedagogies, Practitioners and Identities in Education conference which took place in Birmingham City University on the 13th of July 2015. My name is Thomas Lancaster and this is an introduction to work I've been doing with Robert Clark looking at the health field and what happens when students cheat in that field and it can be quite dangerous. If you've not come across our work on contract cheating and plagiarism before I just want to give you a very brief background. My PhD is in the area of plagiarism particularly prevention and detection and I've subsequently moved on since completion of my PhD in 2003 to look particularly at how students buy work online. My colleague Robert Clark or Detective Bob Clark as we like to call him is now retired. He still teaches quite a lot of stuff because he is a practitioner and is interested in education but he's collected over 25,000 attempts made by students worldwide at contract cheating and a lot of these are in the health area particularly nursing and medicine and related fields and that's what interests us in this work and here's a quote from Bob from an interview broadcast on BBC Radio Kent he is talking about the large amount of work over one million pounds of work which we had detected up to that point where students requesting work online so you can see these large numbers I often see figures in the millions about the amount of work worldwide going around these services every year that encourage students to cheat. So here are a few objectives from this research seminar and if you want to follow along you can also view these slides on my SlideShare account slideshare.net forward slash Thomas Lancaster. I we're looking particularly at why technology ID cheating is a concern. This is really debuting our work in the health field and this is quite an early stage of the work but there's lots of information here. Some of the particular sites available for cheating in nursing and health, the type of assignments we found, just a few examples and one of the things I'm particularly keen to show you is what a nursing essay looks like brought through an essay mill and some ways you can recognize cheating online by these types of students. So first question, why are we so concerned about cheating particularly in the health field? Well, because we don't want people to buy their essays and then subsequently their degree. And there are plenty of sites set up now to target students in the nursing field. This is an example of a site, as you can see, with a British flag there, clearly aimed at the British market, or you notice they also have a US number as well. In fact, if you drill down further into this site, then you'll find it's not based in the UK or the United States at all. But that's something for another talk. But these sites are there, very cleverly marketed and designed to position students to cheat in the nursing field. And of course, we don't want our nurses to cheat. Here's another quote from Bob back in the Nursing Times, a UK publication for nurses in 2008 they were looking at the ways that students in nursing could cheat and at the time Bob mentioned that he'd found all kinds of different areas including nursing. Nursing Times got some quotes for an essay for a second year degree subject on palliative care and they got three quotes between £83 and £179. That's somewhere around the $150 mark up to the $300 mark for people looking at this from a US perspective so quite reasonable but these model essays, so-called model essays that students are buying, are not going to be detected by anti-plagiarism software because all that does is looks for students who have used words that have been used before. And of course, if you pay for original work using an essay mill like this or using a contract cheating site, then you're not going to find that. Here's a response raised to that particular article on the site. You can see it's from a clinical research manager with a PhD, a very senior person within the profession, and he's raising a concern that if student nurses are happy to cheat in their essays, then surely they're going to continue to do this when they're qualified. Why will they suddenly stop being unprofessional and then become professional because 
they're around patients. And some of the real concerns about fitness for practice is about putting people's lives at risk, things they may cheat on. Drug charts, keeping notes and records about patients. What are we doing to stop this kind of cheating? And it's when lives are at risk, when we're talking about real patients, that these things become important. Here's uh, another media article. One of the main reasons for interest in this work is because the media is so interested, particularly in nurses. Again, from Bob, who's tended to do a lot of the media work in this area. But he's mentioned some of the types of work we found online nurses, pharmacists training, even MRI scanner technicians. And these students are inflating their grades and not just harming other practitioners, other medical practitioners, they're also harming other students because a student who cheats their way and gets higher grade than they deserve may be stopping someone else getting a job and that's something we should be equally concerned about. Cheating in health is also a problem all around the world. I like to call this the Great Australian Cheating Scandal of 2015. There have been all kinds of news stories, I just want to pick up on one or two of them here. but. Here's one, the cheating scandal, Sydney University were to review their medical studies unit and what happened there was that they found that students were falsifying their interview records. This was a meant to be a one year with their medical students looking after patients and recording their results and they found that students were falsifying records and they had interviews with patients who had died during that year. And of course, that's not what we want to see. There's a lot more to this story, if you want to read up on it. The link is on the slides there. That perhaps this was a near impossible assignment because students whose patient had passed away during that year didn't have any alternative mechanism that they could use to continue with the assignment other than starting again from scratch. And that does come back to us as educationalists to think carefully about our assessment design. Here's a long-standing story about, yes, there can be serious harm when a unqualified or mistakenly qualified nurse goes in front of patients. This is the story of Bavishan, again from Sydney, University of Western Sydney this time, who fed a patient dishwashing liquid, which they'd put in a pill jar. It was there to clean their teeth, I believe instead of the type of medication that patient was expecting and thankfully this one didn't have fatal consequences but this particular person had failed the English language test six times after registration. Presumably good English language is important for someone in the caring profession not only for fitness for practice but also just to provide a high standard of care to patients who may be in a confused and vulnerable state. Here's a story, or here's a quote from Barbara Beale, a senior academic, at now retired, which is probably why she's been more happy to go on camera and talk about this, from a very interesting TV documentary in Australia that is available to view at the time recording this video, at the link shown. Uh, but she's very concerned that someone may be left on their own in charge of a ward who's not properly qualified or has cheated their way through some aspects of their training and Barbara was talking particularly about care for the elderly for instance in nursing homes where only having one person in duty presumably is much more likely. There are real risks involved with this kind of cheating. Uh, a little bit positive we can occasionally detect when people in the health profession have cheated. There's a couple of examples here from our database. We have many more which I can share in a longer research seminar or a training day in this area. Here's an example from an online tutorial site. People pay $24.99 per month to download a lot of different solutions and this was a assignment for professional development for nurses. One thing we hope of course is our nurses will stay up to date with their professional development and keep their training up to date as new techniques come along and the technologies used in nursing change. But this was contributed earlier this year, a 2000 word essay here but thankfully this one was detected and the reason that one was detected is because this particular solution was available for multiple people to buy and submit. That's not always the case but 
Here's another example, this is slightly older, where we did get lucky and find this, but only through a huge amount of manual work, searching through Google for sections of text. And this was a research essay that a student, we found out, in the future discussions with the people involved, with the academics who'd set this assignment, had paid somebody to write for them. In fact, the person they paid had taken a load of shortcuts. All they did was took an academic paper on uh, this one by Furstenberg and colleagues, teenage pregnancy and childbearing, and they changed some things in that paper. So they changed, for instance, United States, United Kingdom to make this look more local because this was at a UK university. They changed Boston to Wales and they completely changed the reference written in 1989 to pretend it was written in 2001 so it seemed more recent. Now this one was detected but not by Turnitin only through searching for information on Google and this is because this particular student paid somebody very sloppy to write their work for them and of course if you pay somebody who does poor quality work then you're not so like then you may be detected. But Turnitin didn't find this one. This was only through manual work because the lecturer concerned discussed this with us and they were suspicious about the work because some things to do with this just didn't add up to them when they read through the information. So it does show why it's worth checking the information, the references included in student work quite carefully. Now unfortunately not all that work is so easy to detect. Our research focuses mainly on contract cheating. This is where a student pays or uses a third party to get them to do their work for them. Most of the time this is paying but I say may use or involve a third party because sometimes they may use a family member, perhaps a friend, perhaps even a previously qualified student who's had some experience in this area. And our research is focused particularly on what we call agency or auction sites where students put up details of the work they want producing for them and people bid to do that work for them. And in fact most or I would say a huge number of the essay mills use this model anyway regardless whether this is public for the student or whether this is behind closed doors. This was a site which was running in the past called SA Bay. SA Bay is no longer operational in this form, but it is still an example of what a large number of sites look like. Looking at 627 cases there, and subjects aligned to medicine were the fourth most popular subject. And we've seen quite a few similar results now. Even some essay mills have put up details of what areas are most requested, and nursing, health, medicine, that general area always seems to end up in the top five subjects. Business is pretty much always first in the most requested area for students to get work done. And there's some other areas you notice there, for instance, social studies that can be an overlap with the health field when you're thinking about social workers as well. So there is a large market for this kind of work. It's not purely hearsay, it does exist. Here's an example of an assignment we found requested online from what turned out to be an MSc course in Dublin. This cost them 128 euros to get done because we can see the public bids. That's 92 British pounds, probably about 140 US dollars. And the worrying thing about this, first of all, it's master's level work, so not undergraduate work, so presumably this is already a qualified nurse who may or may not have cheated. But this student posted other assignments as well. Was this just a token MSc they needed for promotion or to move into management? Who knows, but this one is particularly worrying. The academic has tried to make them use the theoretical input from a module here, but presumably the student can just supply all the information to a writer as well, and quite a serious case there looking at palliative care. Here's a much longer example, a 15,000 word dissertation. Uh, I've used the language from the original bid and what the student here has submitted is they've given the writer the dissertation and they've given them the comments received from the lecturer. So the writer they're paying can just go straight ahead and make these changes and the lecturer wouldn't be a call concerned because they'd think that this was just what they're asked and this one is dentistry, root canal therapy, just showing that the health profession can cover all kinds of things and certainly we don't want to see our students cheating in their large capstone projects or their dissertations. 
and of course this can start before students even go to university this is an example for enrollment onto a nursing course the spelling mistakes there are all from the students and this particular course is trying to attract good students looking for reasons they want to take this looking for a career plan but this student is just cheating hopefully this didn't happen when they eventually got on the course as we know that they likely did. This particular student made several other postings as well. So there are plenty of examples of work being put up. Nearly anything you may think a student can cheat on, they will cheat on. I'd like to share with you an example of what an essay looks like. This was from a study I was involved with, with BBC Southeast Today. That's the regional news across the Southeast region. And there I worked with a a journalist, Piers Hopkirk, and also a uh, intern student, I believe there, Cecily Snowball, and we commissioned a 1500 word nursing essay from one of those sites, and the report showed they were very blatant, this site that we went to for the essay. £296 was paid by the BBC, I think that's at the upper end of what needs to be paid for this. Uh, this was a real nursing essay, incidentally the topic came from an institution in the southeast region and you see there that I'm the expert in that area that they worked with and this was the essay. It looks just like any other essay and one thing we pick up on quite often is the perfection of the work that students are submitting, particularly the layout. They've got the double spacing, everything justified, aligned along that right column, uh, title page, very clear references at the end, everything we'd expect to see in an essay. It looks very good. 2,185 words, including the reference page. There's really six pages of content there, which, if you work that out, presumably around 300 words per page. This is how the essay started off, nursing clinical practices. So again, we're looking at the real area which feeds into work. Uh, and this paper focuses on the author's experience of clinical practices. Well, of course it doesn't because this author is, has never been anywhere near a hospital as far as we know. One thing I do know from looking inside essay mills is that an essay writer can pick up nearly any subject. They could do nursing one day, they could do business the next day, they could then move on to social care. They could then move on to history, evening as literature. They're expected to be a jack of all trades and move around and focus on the form of the essays. But they've provided two case studies focusing on patient dignity and patient privacy. And uh, you notice that example included on the slide where Marjorie, who had been admitted to the hospital with a urinary tract infection, who found that the attitudes when she needed to use toilet facilities were very unhelpful for us. And in fact, that continues with quite a detailed and potentially distressing example about when a male nurse was in charge of her. Probably not too realistic about how things go, but that's what was focused on there. And the impression of this when I marked this is that this was good work. There was nothing to stand out and make it look that like something that a student couldn't write if they'd gone through that particular experience. And in my opinion, not being a nursing expert, this would have easily passed and probably received a good mark as well. The worrying thing about the site here is that the one that was used, because this particular article also, as well as being a video, made it up on text form, the essay company picked this up as good publicity and they've used this to promote their own service. Now the first thing that stands out to me if you look at the bottom left is the way they spell the word featured. It doesn't show great attention to detail and in fact this also is not a UK based company if you drill down. But my quote there that was nothing that would raise any alarm and it'd be good enough to pass is fairly typical and that is worrying that's how essay companies are going about their whole business model and millions of pounds going through these companies in the health and nursing field. This also leads on nicely to the final section of this talk on detecting contract cheating and one thing I said straight away is that you're going to see some excellent quality work and perhaps this can be something that you use to your advantage when you're marking work. You look for work that's too good, too formulaic to or written. This builds on also on some information presented by 
the two authors there, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce their names, at the Plagiarism Across Europe and Beyond conference in 2015 in the Czech Republic recently, uh, and our own experience as well. This is looking at manual detection and a few ideas. Uh, one thing they did pick up on, which I think is great, is that a lot of essay writers don't have access to the full academic research journal databases that we have. And so there's an over-reliance on the information abstracts. And if you find a paper where nearly all the information, including quotes, or including the ideas, or including statistics, could have come from abstracts, then there's a good chance this was written by a ghostwriter, because they're focusing in on the free information they have available. We are looking at that perfect technical formatting, perfect technical word use, maybe the odd bit of American English that slips in depending on where people are trained, but nowadays these sites are very good at checking for UK grammar if they're working within the UK or US grammar working within the US. I do recommend that all work continues to go through Turnitin and one thing we've also found that can be give away a very low Turnitin scores. It's almost as if these writers have access to Turnitin, as many of them do, and they can make sure that nothing suspicious is raised. And as you'll know from the nursing essay I showed you from the BBC a few minutes ago, personal experiences that don't match the student. So if you were able to know what position that student had been through in their nursing career and that they're unlikely to have come across anything that would match that case study, then that can also be a giveaway. And there can be further giveaways as well. This, this one amused me. This is from Nick Mamatis, who is a former ghostwriter or former term paper, paper writer, as the American term is, who found that he was productive. This person could turn around one or more essays a day, sometimes several essays a day, but he put in various jokes and entertainments to amuse him. And you notice here, as he said, he'd give the student, uh, he'd refer to student life experiences and give the student sexual hang-ups because we often set work which says, refer to examples from your own experience. So if you see these very unusual experiences or perhaps ones that you don't think a student would want to admit to in an essay, however confidential it was, then that could also be something to watch out for. I hope you found this research seminar useful. This is very much the start of our work in this field. In fact, we have several hours worth of presentation materials in this field, including more statistics and more data to go through, which are very clean to share. This will also make it its way into some of our written publications in time, but I'm one of these people who prefers to share good information, good research as soon as possible through seminars, through videos, as soon as we can. We can easily present this as a one-hour research seminar, either looking at general work on cheating and plagiarism, or particularly nursing and health and medical education. Uh, I'm very happy to present this as the keynote. There's lots of good examples. There's a lot more detail in some of the examples that I can't include within the time limitations of this video. And we're happy to run a full day or half day training workshop. We've done this many times before and this can be tailored towards medicine or many other academic disciplines as well. We've got lots of references for our work. Again I recommend that you look at the SlideShare. My account is slideshare.net forward slash Thomas Lancaster. Feel free to contact me as well. I did record another video looking at some of the other sources nurses can use to cheat which I think is really interesting as well. There. And here's all my contact details and Robert Clark's contact details there. Do follow me on Twitter at Dr. Lancaster and look at the hashtag hash contract cheating for some of the discussions in the wider field of ghost writing, term paper mills, essay mills, and just general academic misconduct. Thank you for joining me for this research seminar. Do get in contact and I do encourage you to think about the challenges involved within the health professions and the fitness for practice area when students are getting qualifications they don't deserve and then they're going to work with patients in the real world and beyond the educational arena. Do join in with me for my other training videos and my blog at thomaslancaster.co.uk. Thanks again and speak to you soon.